US guided intervention, one of the most useful tools in the world of endoscopy. In Denmark, in 1998, Willman and his colleagues published the first case of single step US guided drainage of pseudopancreatic cyst. Three years later, in France, Giovannini and his colleagues published the first US guided biliary drainage. In 2015, in USA, Khashab and his colleagues published the first human case series of US guided gastroenterostomy. Over years, this US guided techniques have improved marvelously. They are elegant techniques with undoubtful evidence of their effectiveness and safety. However, complications related to these techniques are still very notorious because when they happen, they put patients' life at great risk. In this video, I'm gonna share with you three cases of complications related to US guided interventions and how we were lucky to succeed to manage them endoscopically. Please stay tuned. I am Muhammad Abdul Hafiz and this is The Endoscopist. The first case I'm going to present you is a US guided gastroenterostomy where a stent dislocation happened. It was a 66 years old male patient with cancer head of pancreas with gastric outlet obstruction. Here is the video of the insertion of the gastroenterostomy. I will make a dedicated video to describe our modification uh, regarding this technique and how with our modification we make it simple and safe technique. We can see here shortly with US guidance we locate the small bowel loop and then we insert the hot axis stent and with giving some contrast medium through the stent we can as you can see here on the right corner we can see here the entrography, which proves that we are in the right loop. Then we deploy, I will forward the video, we deploy the distal flange of the stent. As we can see in the US picture, as well as in the fluoroscopy. And then the proximal flange will be deployed. Here is a picture we can see through the stent, the small bowel lumen. And by giving contrast medium through the stent, we can see, or doing barium follow through, we can see that there is no leakage and the stent is located very nicely. What happened to this case? The patient suffered two days later from abdominal pain. And for that, they planned to do EGD. During the upper endoscopy, a colleague of mine went through or passed through the stent from the stomach to the small bowel. And actually, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't pass with the scope through a freshly inserted gastroenterostomy because the dislocation risk is very high. And that's exactly what happened. I remember that day, I went home, and then they called me and they told me the stent or the gastroenterostomy is dislocated in the abdominal cavity. So I went very quickly to the uh, hospital and I performed the endoscopy and it looked exactly like this. We are here in the stomach and we have the opening. Through the opening we go to the peritoneum. Actually it is uh, not a very nice experience to um, enter the abdominal cavity and the biggest challenge at the beginning was to find the stent. The abdominal cavity is huge, the intestinal loops are uh, many, but under fluoroscopic guidance, if you can see here in the right picture and uh, uh, below, you can, it can facilitate to look at the stent. The next step was, or my idea at that time, is to try to collapse, the, to collapse the proximal flange with a snare 
and try to pull it back in the stomach. But as you can see here, it was impossible. That's why I tried it again, but this time with a forceps, which also didn't work because the opening in the stomach is too tight for that. And also to collapse the flange of the, of the stent um, is not doable. So we had to change our plan or to think about other solution, which was to go through the axis as deep as uh, possible inside the small bowel, put a wire, and put over the wire, we put an esophageal stent, uh, fully covered esophageal stent, and to insert it beside the scope through the, abdom um, uh, through the opening in the stomach. But we had another problem, which is the distance between the stomach and the small bowel loop is huge, as you can see here on this curve. So the solution for that was to approximate or to oppose the stent by pulling it back with the small bowel as near as possible to the gastric wall. So I succeeded to pull it back, but there is still 4 cm distance between the um, stent, the proximal flange of the stent, and the uh, gastric wall. But that was fine. The most important thing that the stent will bridge it, the esophageal stent will bridge this gap. So we are deploying the stent very, very cautiously under endoscopic visualization. As you can see here, this is part of the esophageal stent being deployed in the abdominal cavity or in the peritoneum. And this is here the opening in the stomach, pulling the scope back, and now we are in the stomach and the proximal flange of the esophageal stent is opened. So the proximal flange now in the stomach and the distal flange in the small bowel and as I said there is something like 4 centimeters in the peritoneal cavity but there is no leakage at the end. I have to note that the first thing to do with these patients with perforations in general if you have a lot of CO2 you have to work with CO2 of course if you have a lot of CO2 in the, in the abdominal cavity you have to decompress the abdominal uh, wall. The patient was intubated during this procedure and at the end we confirmed the absence of leakage with giving contrast medium as you can see here I can make it bigger here the stomach here the proximal flange of the uh, sphagial stent here the distal flange in the small bowel and we can see here there is no leakage at all the patient was extubated at the second day and he uh, was discharged five days later, completely tolerating food um, and he lived at least five months afterwards and died because of pancreas cancer. The second case I want to show you is US guided hepaticogastrostomy also with a stent dislocation. We all know the hepatic gastrostomy or AOS guided hepatic gastrostomy where we insert a stent between the stomach and the liver to drain uh, the biliary system. Here we have a 78 years old female patient with, uh, also with cancer pancreas with biliary uh, and gastric outlet obstruction. We inserted first US guided gastroenterostomy and a few weeks later, because of the cholestasis, we inserted a hepatic gastrostomy. At the ward, they inserted for her because of the nausea. Two days later, they inserted a nasogastric tube. We believe that this nasogastric tube put a pressure on the hepatogastrostomy, on the metal stent, leading to its dislocation in the peritoneum, which means that we have the part of the stent is in the liver and the proximal part is in the peritoneum. That means that we have a leakage of bile in the peritoneal cavity or biliary ascites. When I did the uh, upper endoscopy, it looked like this. I found the opening that we did for the hepatic gastrostomy. It is very tight, as we can see. And the plan is, is to go to the peritoneum and try to find the liver with the inserted stent and to pull it back. But to go through this opening, it was not possible with the normal upper endoscopy. That's why, as we, here is the picture under fluoroscopic guidance. Here is the gastroenterostomy. 
down there and here the hepatic gastrostomy all this part is in the liver and the proximal part is in the peritoneum and of course because upper endoscopy is too thick for this opening I used a duodenoscope side viewing duodenoscope and through duodenoscope I used a spyglass I used a spyglass to enter the abdominal cavity or the peritoneum and we can see here we were um, able to find the liver with the stent inside and with using spyglass forceps we were able or uh, um, spy bite we were able to pull it back to put the proximal part of the stent back to the stomach as we can see here when you look at this picture this part of the stent is still inside the liver but a bigger part is in the stomach and bridging also the abdominal cavity it was very important and critical to act very quickly before the stent would, would be completely dislocated from the liver so we cannulated the liver again or the biliary tree through the stent put a wire and we decided to go for stent prolongation you can see here this is the old stent there is a wire inside it and here the new stent being deployed with its proximal part still in the old stent and its distal part just above the um, hilum of the liver and to sec secure it more we cannulated the two stents with a cannula and then we put a wire and over the wire we put a double pigtail stent here so we have here two metal stents from the stomach till the hilum and through the metal stent till the second part of the duodenum we have a double pigtail stent the patient went very fine just mild pain lasts for one day under antibiotics and she could leave after three days you can see here the CT scan after the procedure now the third case and the last case which is very interesting is US guided necrosectomy um, it's interesting because it's very rare that a stent will be dislocated um, during the necrosectomy or during pseudocyst drainage because the gastric wall is part of the capsule of the, of the um, wall of pancreatic necrosis let's see what happened with this case it was 36 years old female patient with biliary pancreatitis who developed wall of pancreas necrosis as we can see here in CT pictures four weeks after the acute pancreatitis that we have here a wall of pancreatic necrosis it's here and here is the stomach and as we can see here we have a very small window between the stomach and the wall of pancreatic necrosis which makes the drainage a little bit dangerous because you have to puncture very accurately and still the perforation risk is high so we went for drainage as we can see here we punctured with a needle we give contrast medium we put a wire and over the wire we insert, inserted our hot axial stent usually when we when we use hot axial stent we use direct uh, puncture but in this case we inserted over the wire because of the difficulty of the position and we did balloon dilatation and necrosectomy as we can see here here is the stent after insertion here is the balloon dilatation and here is the necrosectomy and at the end we put double pigtail stents inside the hot axios patient went very fine she came back to us two days later and during the necrosectomy something happened with manipulation with entering the cavity through the axios someone the hot axis was dislocated the distal flange of the hot axis was dislocated in the peritoneum because the retroperitoneum was not adherent to the stomach as you can see here we are with our scope inside the necrotic area and then you pull back and then you are in the peritoneum
And then if you go further backwards, you see the axis still fixed to the gastric wall. And it was a big problem because if you think about the solutions to remove the hot axios and to close the, the, the perforations or the openings with um, visco clip OTSC, uh, you still have the retroperitoneum open to the peritoneal cavity, which is um, a big problem. Uh, to insert uh, something like esophageal metal stent or duodenal stent, it is very traumatic because it's, it will be too long. And the, and the distal flange can cause some erosions or uh, uh, vascular uh, trauma uh, inside the cavity. What we did, we removed the hot axial stent and we looked for a stent, also lumen opposing stent, but with um, a flat uh, flanges and with a big distance between the flanges and that was the spaxius, which is, was, it was my first experience with the spaxius stent so we entered the cavity after removing the hot axios and under endoscopic vision, under endoscopic visualization, we opened the distal flange of the spaxius and very cautiously we tried to pull back the retroperitoneum to the gastric wall. It was very cautious and very slowly because if you pulled, if you if you put a lot of um, pressure while pulling back, the stent will um, this uh, misdeployment will occur, and we tried to avoid this. It was her only chance. So as we can see, the distal flange inside the wall of pancreatic necrosis, we are pulling it back, and we are trying to keep the minimal distance between the retroperitoneum and the stomach and now we are releasing the proximal flange. As I said, it was my first experience with, with the spaxius um, and I, did, I was not very aware with the markations but it succeeded very well. We'll go through it now and it is fully covered there is no leakage, everything is fine. With a CT scan afterwards, we postponed the necrosectomy for two weeks to make sure that everything would be adherent. And after two weeks, we did another uh, necrosectomy session. It was the last session, as we can see here. And we put two double pigtails inside the spaxius stent. This is a spaxius here. It is not very radio opaque. You can see it very difficultly here. And the CT scan afterwards was very good. If you have a look here at the stomach, you can follow this. I will run the video again. And you can see here the spaxius and here the pigtails. And the cavity is completely or almost completely disappeared. Just try to here. So, as we can see here, EOS-guided interventions are very elegant techniques, but you have always to think about the complications and how to manage them. I hope these three examples will help you in difficult situations to, to decide quickly and uh, to make the right decision at the right time. You have always to have interdisciplinary team working with you. Don't take risks, only do interventions when you can deal with the complications. If you have any further requests or questions, please write me in the comments. See you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching.